Okay, I think uh, it's recording. So, uh, yeah, uh, welcome everyone to our first uh, event in philosophy uh, talk series organized by the Department of Philosophy at Marmara University. Uh, today, I'm happy to announce you our present uh, presenter, Professor Manuel Knoll. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor Knoll. Uh, so I think some of you know Professor Knoll, some of you don't. Because of that, uh, let me say a few words about uh, Professor uh, Knoll. Uh, Manuel Knoll is uh, currently professor of political theory and philosophy at Turkish German University. Uh, he's a member of uh, Instituto Lucio and Novo Seneca of Uni uh, Universidad Carlos III de Madrid. Hopefully, I'm saying this uh, correctly, uh, Manuel. Almost, almost. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> And uh, he's an associate uh, editor of Polis, uh, the journal for Greek and uh, Roman political thought. Uh, he has lectured and published widely on topics pertaining to ancient, modern, and contemporary political philosophy and ethics. In particular, ancient and contemporary theories of justice Deep Disagreement on Justice, Values, and Morals, uh, Plato, Aristotle, Machiavelli, Nietzsche, Rawls, and Walser, Social Philosophy, and Critical Theory. Professor Knoll has various publications, which include books, book chapters, and journal articles. He is an author of three books and uh, 70 articles or chapters editor of six volumes, co-editor of book series Collegium Politicum. And uh, Professor Knoll is a member of the uh, scientific boards of book series, Stadt Discurse, Koinos Logos, and Cultura e Formazione. And he is a member of the scientific boards of journal Scientia Arte, Sophia Philosophical Review, Archaeologos, Kaige, and Etica e Politica. And uh, in uh, 2016, Professor Knoll was awarded Promio Lucio Colletti in the area of philosophy, Rome, Rome uh, Capitoline Hill. Today to today's talk is entitled uh, Deep Disagreement on Values, Justice, and Moral Issues their meta-ethical relevance and the need for an ethics of disagreement. Let me say a few words about the method of this uh, presentation, this speech. Professor Knoll suggests a method for his presentation. I am respecting that. After every uh, finished section of his uh, talk, we are going to allow questions related to the section. So once again, please join me in welcoming Professor Manuel Knoll. The floor is yours. We are looking forward to your talk, your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for this kind introduction, Erdal. I'm glad to be here and talk about my recent work on, on disagreement. I, I, I've been working on this topic for, for, for many years, and I think it's also a very important uh, topic. Please, after you heard my title, please don't leave immediately. Um, I will explain you exactly uh, what, what these complicated terms mean. Um, let me share my screen just a second. You should be able to... Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. See your screen, okay. Maybe, let me start with explaining my um, very difficult sounding title. Uh, I'm going to talk about disagreements and people disagree all the time. There are all kinds of disagreements. Um, 
I'm moving on one slide. Um, I'm, I'm saying here, there are all kinds of disagreements, for example, easily solvable ones. Let's say, what time is it now? We disagree about the time. We can, we can check some authoritative um, clock and we, we solve the disagreement. Then there are genuine versus illusory disagreements. For example, if we say, if we say abortion, I say abortion is wrong, and you say, no, abortion is right. But, but maybe we don't really know what we're talking about. Maybe I think abortion is legally wrong and you think abortion is morally wrong. So, so we can, it's not a real disagreement, right? Because if we clear, clarify what we mean, uh, the, the disagreement is, is gone. Then we have, of course, um, disagreements about taste. Uh, there is this famous Latin saying, de coloribus et de gustibus non est disputandum. We cannot really solve the disagreement whether Levrek or, or Chupra is, is, is the better fish. Um, if we introduce Kalkan, maybe we can convince uh, everyone, but if it's just Levrek versus uh, Chupra, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, we will never solve this disagreement. Then there has been a lot of, by the way, about this topic in the last years, there was so much literature, there was so much discussions, especially peer disagreements. There is a discipline called the epistemology of disagreement. What if two peers disagree, two scientists uh, disagree, how, what should they do? Should they be steadfast? Uh, should they kind of bracket their views? Uh, so there are many, many uh, disagreements and, and, and the, to open the full big picture, um, that's my second bullet point here on this slide. People profoundly disagree on essentials such as religion. Um, that's I think especially in Turkey where there are uh, more religious people than in Germany. Uh, that's a big, big topic. Um, the people who think they're religious, the people who think they're secular. Um, and, and the problem is also, it's, and here we're already opening up the floor towards an ethics of disagreement. Uh, how should we deal with these disagreements? How should we handle these disagreements? It's, it's so easy to say the other person from the other camp is, is ignorant, is, is unintelligent, is, is backwards um, or something. So, so, so that's one of the big questions I'm, I'm working on. So how should we deal uh, with these disagreements and, and why should we respect people who have uh, different opinions? Disagreements about values, uh, that's another big thing. And we, were, we have a sociologist here from, from our department. So later we'll talk about Max Weber, uh, about Yesire Berlin. Um, he, he, he has a lot to say, especially Weber has a lot about say about disagreements, about values. I mean, give, let me give you an example, which, um, which political entity should I be loyal to? Should I be loyal to my nation? Should I be loyal to my region? Or am I a cosmopolitan? Is my first loyalty to the cosmos? Because we're all equal, we are all uh, uh, citizens of the cosmos, um, or has, do I have any, is there any reason why uh, my nation deserves the first loyalty? So there are lots of uh, disputes. I will go into uh, this. I, I will start my talk uh, with talking about disagreements about justice. Justice is often seen as our main ethical and uh, political uh, virtue. Um, and, and, and I will show you that from the ancient world uh, till today, there are lots of disagreements about justice. I will talk about the ancients. I will talk about Karl Marx, who also has an understanding of a just distribution of social wealth. I will talk a bit about contemporary philosophy. So the first section of my talk will be disagreements about justice. The second section will be on disagreements about values. Um, then let me move back uh, for a moment to um, the meta-ethical relevance. So what is meta-ethics? Also just a brief, uh, just to give you some idea uh, of what I'm talking about. Uh, meta-ethics is a sub-discipline of ethics. 
usually we talk, when we talk about ethics, we talk about normative ethics. What should I do, says Kant? How should I behave uh, towards others? Should I lie or are there white lies if the consequences are good? So that's um, normative ethics. I'm, I'm talking about this very little, but meta ethics is what do we mean if we say something is right or something is wrong? Are we referring to moral facts? Like if we say the, the earth is moving uh, on an elliptic, uh, not a circle, on an ellipsis around the, the earth, that's kind of an astronomical fact. But if we say um, this is right, this is wrong, what, what are we saying? Am I expressing my emotions? Uh, am I referring to moral facts? Like Plato uh, says, yeah, there are these forms, the form of the good. And that's kind of an objective, um, conception of the good. So, so and I'm claiming um, that these disagreements uh, about justice, about values, about morals, is abortion right or wrong, that these disagreements have a high uh, relevance for the question, what's, wh what are we talking about when we talk about something is right or wrong? And my thesis will be, um, that we cannot agree, that we can discuss, that we can talk, that we can try to convince, convince each other about what is right and wrong. And in the end, we will still not uh, agree. And I will, of course, try to substantiate uh, this thesis. But one reason why we can't agree is because there are no moral facts. There is no idea or form of the good like Plato uh, claims. There is no objective moral uh, reality. Um, there are just different views about justice. Okay, and the, eth the ethics of disagreement, that's kind of my last part of uh, today's talk. I'm, I'm claiming uh, that we need uh, an ethics of disagreement, uh, how to cope with these disagreements. These disagreements about justice, sometimes they even lead to civil wars if uh, the people think their government is, is unjust, um, and, and you know, if, if you think an abortion performing doctor um, is a killer, is someone who is killing uh, living beings, you, you, you might try to assassinate him. So, so I think we have to find ways uh, uh, to deal about, uh, with, our, about, with our disagreements and to, to, to talk about them and to find a civilized way to, to, to cope with these disagreements. Okay, and of course, like I'm going back to my second slide, of course, there are lots of uh, disagreements about um, moral issues like is abortion right or wrong, capital punishment. Now for some years, I haven't heard much uh, of the reintroduction of the capital punishment in Turkey anymore. It was a few years ago, it was a discussion, gay marriage, preferential hiring uh, should in Germany if you if you are applying for an academic position, it, it says um, women uh, have an advantage if they're equally qualified. Is this just or is this not just? And again, I guess we will have uh, disagreements here. Taxation that's so important uh, in contemporary political philosophy. Um, is it is it uh, just that the state asks six fifty percent of your income? Um, today I checked my, my, my salary and I'm paying almost 40 percent now, now, now to the state and of course I'm saying this is unjust um, but you know um, on the other hand you know this money is spent to to fund the welfare state and to help uh, the poor shouldn't I uh, show some solidarity and don't I have some reasons for solidarity. We will see John Rawls in his famous theory of justice, 1971. He says, yeah, we should uh, compensate for our advantages if we have these advantages. Robert Nozick published an important book three years later. He said, no, I'm working half of my day as a slave if I pay 50% taxes. I'm working for others. That's not justifiable. Okay, so I guess now you have a vague idea um, where this is all going. Um, let me start with a thesis. I call this the thesis of deep disagreements. And you will very soon see that with this thesis, I'm attacking the, 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 the biggest political 
uh, philosophers, the most famous political philosophers. I'm, I'm attacking John Rawls and I'm attacking Jürgen Habermas. These are kind of my, my opponents against these guys. Uh, a lot of my research is, is directed because these guys claim we can agree. We just need to talk it through. We need to exchange arguments without forcing each other. And then, as Habermas puts it, the constrainless constraint of the better argument will lead us to agreement. And I think, no way. OK, um, deep this here is the thesis. Uh, deep disagreements are disagreements in good faith that cannot be resolved through the use of reasons and arguments. You will see in a minute um, where I'm kind of summarizing the positions of Habermas and Rawls that they think, yes, if we exchange reasons and arguments in the original position um, in a state without domination, we will finally convince each other. Um, and uh, the second part of my thesis of deep disagreements, widespread and deep disagreements on justice, values and moral issues exist. By the way, there is the term deep disagreements is not my own term. There is an article published in Informal Logic, a very interesting journal. Um, they say, oh, we don't need all these formalizations, all these symbols, <laughs> uh, logic. We can also talk about logic without all this apparatus. And there is a guy called Robert Fogelin who published an article in 85, The Logic of Deep Disagreements. And I will also, in the wake of the talk, I will also introduce you to his ideas. All right. Against Rawls and Habermas' illusion of a moral consensus. As I said before, the thesis of disagreement is mainly directed against Kantians. They're both uh, fans of the German uh, philosopher Immanuel Kant, who believe that our reason is like a universal or general uh, faculty. Uh, the thesis of disagreement is mainly directed against Kantians, such as Jürgen Habermas, and John Rawls, who claims, so these are the claims I'm attacking in my section on justice. One, a rational agreement on a conception of liberal and democratic justice is possible in a fair initial situation of choice where people exchange arguments. Um, justice as fairness, that's Rawls' approach. So he claims people will agree in the end on his two principles of justice, uh, which um, are competing mainly for Rawls with utilitarian or to put it in more contemporary terminology with consequentialist theories. Okay, I will come to consequentialism a bit later. Second claim, uh, an overlapping consensus on liberal political, on a liberal political conception of justice can be reached. That's uh, Rawls's later thesis in his second big book, Political Liberalism, published 21 years after the theory of justice. And Habermas, um, number three, he claims unimpeded discourses and arguments based on communicative reason, that's a key technical term for his philosophy, based on communicative reason are generally able to solve disagreements and to lead to consensus in moral issues. So this is the camp of the, let's call them consensus theoreticians uh, who I am attacking. All right. Um, Let's come to disagreements about justice. Let's talk about justice and let's talk in particular about social and political justice. Most, um, I'm coming to my slide, most theoreticians agree that distributive justice is connected to some form of equality. But we have a big disagreement here and the core disagreement uh, which is a deep disagreement, which means it cannot be rationally overcome. We can discuss this as long as we want. In the end, uh, we won't be able to convince each other. Uh, here's the core disagreement in a very simple phrase. 
does justice demand equality for all or just for equals? The first ones we can call the egalitarians or the egalitarian camp. And the second camp, um, I, I call them the proportionalists because they say we need proportional justice. What is proportional justice? If we grade um, our students' papers, um, we, everyone, we don't think it's just that everyone gets the same grade. We don't give everyone A. Uh, we give equal performances, equal grades. So we give the grades in proportion to the performances. And, and, and we think this is just. Others think no grades are unjust at all. We should not give any grades. We should abolish grades. We should treat everyone, everyone equally. And you know, that's kind of, um, I'm coming to that a bit later. That seems to be the camp that won. Uh, we, we seem to have some egalitarian consensus uh, today, but there are still lots of philosophers. You know, I'm not taking sides here. I'm just. I'm just showing uh, the, the battlefield. Um, okay, um, here some terminology, egalitarian distributive justice is based on arithmetic, numeric, or Michael Walzer calls it simple equality. Michael Walzer says, if I have seven heads and you have seven heads, we have an equal amount of heads. That's simple equality. Share the cake, everyone gets one piece no matter who, who bought the ingredients, who baked the cake, egalitarian justice says everyone gets the same. Um, versus, and if you come to politics, then that of course <laughs> uh, gets a bit more problematic than like if we just distribute a cake. Um, and the op opposite view uh, or opposite concept is proportional distributive justice based on proportional or geometric equality. As I said before, grading giving equal grades to equals and unequal grades to unequals, but we're still trying to treat everyone equal. Every student gets treated equally, uh, but every student doesn't get the same. Okay, that, that's proportional justice. All right, let's move for a quick moment to the ancient world, uh, one of the master philosophers on justice, Aristotle. Um, Aristotle, his Nicomachean Ethics, book five, is devoted to justice. Um, he talks about political justice in his politics, especially book three, but also somewhere else. So Aristotle reports and analyzes a central political quarrel and disagreement of his time. You know, democracy was introduced like a hundred years um, before Aristotle wrote uh, his works. So the, the political disagreement at the time um, is called, is, is it just that all free men participate equally in politics? You see, um, not even Rousseau, who is usually regarded as the one who talks about the sovereignty of people. For him, women are clearly not excluded, not included in, in, in political participation. That's only like comes only a hundred years ago with the Weimar constitutions after World War One, so so it's still unequal from uh, our co contemporary perspective. So he says, is it just that all free-born men participate equally in politics, or should political power be distributed in proportion to qualities such as wealth, noble descent, or virtue? Um, census suffrage. We still had until till 1918 um, in, in, in many countries that only the wealthy people were allowed to vote. And if you look at the French Revolution, uh, fraternité, liberté, égalité, equality, if you look at the constitutional drafts after the French Revolution, 1789, uh, two of these drafts said only the rich can participate. So equality, no. Nah proportional, clearly not egalitarian equality. And you know, in the ancient world, so there were kind of the wealthy people who claimed we contribute more, then there are the well-born who claim we have this virtue of the family. And then we have what Plato and Aristotle themselves want that the morally and intellectually most virtuous 
citizens rule. Plato, that's the philosophers. Uh, for Aristotle, that's people like Pericles, the main politician of Athenian democracy, someone who has phronesis, someone who uh, has prudence and knows how to make the citizens lead a good and happy life. And you know, the Democrats say, democratic man, we always have to say, say we're all born free, we're all citizens of Athens. We should all uh, participate equally in politics. Why should others um, have so much more power than us? Why should we be included, excluded from, from political uh, decisions? And, and, and I'm coming to my second bullet point here. Aristotle's thesis is um, in book five where he talks about revolutions, where he talks about upheavals. Here he says the moral outrage caused by such disagreements on just political distributions is a central cause for uprisings and civil wars. You had constantly um, civil wars in, in the Greek world, especially during the Peloponnesian War. It was Athens that made the Greek world safe for democracy. On the one hand, on the other hand, there was Sparta who abolished the democracies. And there was in every polis, there was a, a democratic faction and there was an oligarchic uh, faction. And the, the Democrats Aristotle is reporting, they said it's so unjust that we're excluded from uh, the political power. Uh, we, we, have to, we, we have to stand up uh, against this. And, and the oligarchs said, yeah, why should we allow all the people to have the same power um, if we contribute so much? Okay, uh, and, and here, I think we're already, I said this already before, we can get some idea why we need, um, why we need an ethics of disagreement because uh, political disagreements can lead uh, to violence and uh, to civil wars and civil wars, uh, look at Syria, mm, it was not all about justice, but of course the, 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 the uprisings against, against Assad also had to do that people thought it's unjust that the guy is not really doing any political reforms. Um, okay, yes, um, let's move a bit faster. Um, let's move to the modern time. Let's move, um, now we're looking at the different camps. We have two camps, we have the proportionalists and we have the egalitarians. Um, in the modern world, there is also a central disagreement among the defenders of proportional equality. Um, and one achievement of the French Revolution was that careers were open to talents. Before careers, important careers were open to aristocrats. Um, so, so now something what we call now the, the performance principle. Like if you have a talent, if you perform well, uh, it's just to give you a position, to give you a certain job. Um, but that's one perspective. Marx, Karl Marx has a very different perspective. So I'm reading here the second bullet point. Should social distributions be based on individual contributions to society or on individual needs? The central disagreements concerns the question of which inequalities are relevant in just distributions based on proportional and geometric equality. So the performance principle and Marx, they both defend proportional equality, but they just have very different views which inequalities matter. Is it the contribution to society or is it the individual need? Um, I'm reading the last bullet point about the performance principle. According to the performance principle, unequal performances deserve unequal rewards or pays. That's just, right? If you perform better, if you work harder, um, if you have a higher qualification, you should, you should get more, more uh, money, more salary. Um, greater performance merit greater rewards or pays in proportion uh, to the performance. And there are lots of ongoing discussions. What are just wages? Uh, get CEOs of banks paid too much? 
very likely they do, especially when they're bailed out by taxpayers' money. Um, all right, um, and now we come to Marx. Marx has a very different view here. Um, in contrast to the performance principle, Marx holds that only unequal needs matter and that society's riches should be distributed exclusively based on such needs. So Marx's uh, principle of distributive justice, and there is a big discussion, Marx and justice, but, but I think we have some good reasons to say this is Marx's understanding of distributive justice. He even uses this term this in the critique of the Gotha program. I'm just giving you a very brief summary of this here. Uh, Marx says, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. So everyone should contribute to society. To He's talking about a higher, as he sees it, a communist society. He, he says, yeah, everyone should contribute what everyone can. But if it's about claims towards society, the only thing that matters are the needs. And this needs principle, as we can call it, um, is still defended a lot by contemporary political philosophers. You know, John Rawls uh, makes a reference to it. Michael Walser uh, makes it uh, clearly the center of uh, the sphere of justice where it's about distributing welfare, uh, David Miller theories of social justice. So that's a still uh, a very, very, uh, has still lots of defenders, uh, this principles. Um, yes, and the question is here, you know, what, what Marx does, he, he detaches these two things. He says, it doesn't really matter how much you contribute. Uh, he says, if like um, a bachelor um, does, amazing performances, he should still get much more than someone who has a big family and has higher needs. And, you know, according to the performance principle, that's so unjust. Um, but, you know, here we have another di deep disagreement about justice. Like before, should political power be distributed to all freeborn men, or should it only be distributed to equals, equals who have more virtue, um, who have more wealth, uh, who contribute more to society. Okay, so starting with the French Revolution, uh, the egalitarians seem to be winning. Uh, but of course, there are lots of others who are who are not uh, who are still defending proportionalism. According to Friedrich Nietzsche, a just distribution must distribute goods in proportion to existing inequalities and allot equal shares only to equals, not to everyone. Here a nice Nietzsche quote, he says, the doctrine of equality, but no poison is more poisonous than this, because it seems as if justice itself is preaching here. Well, in fact, it is the end of justice. Equality for the equal, inequality for the unequal, that is what justice would really say, along with its corollary corollary, uh, never make the unequal equal. That's Nietzsche's big fear that the rise of egalitarianism uh, leads to making the unequals equal, um, abolishing the, the differences. Um, and a highly respected philosopher, John Stuart Mill, um, after Bentham, the second most important utilitarianist, um, he, when he talks about political justice, he's in line with Nietzsche. Um, he says he defends proportionalism by advocating a distribution of unequal voting rights according to people's unequal value and unequal worth of their opinions. This value can be measured by their unequal virtue, intelligence, and knowledge. Yeah, give everyone one vote, but the ones who have more knowledge, who have more intelligence, should have, in proportion to their knowledge, many more votes. So again, we have the same deep disagreement. Should everyone has uh, the same amount of uh, political power? Should everyone participate equally? Or should unequals, some people who are um, outstanding in some factor, should they get more? That's the disagreement. And of course, 
Um, now that's not very often discussed, but you know, after Trump and Brexit and a couple of other uh, elections, um, we can at least argue that it's worth to, to talk about this for a moment. Okay, that's not my, my, my topic here. Um, and I'm moving on a bit faster because time um, is passing. I already said um, that the egalitarians seem to have won. You know, census suffrage was abolished after World War I, also after World War I, 1918, 1919. In most uh, con uh, European constitutions, women got the right to vote. So there was clearly an abolishment of several inequalities and the world uh, became more equal. Uh, Will Kimlicker, uh, in his book, uh, Contemporary Political Philosophy, he, he claims even today we're standing on the egalitarian plateau. Um, I, I think that is clearly uh, not right. I will not go into these things. I will jump over it. I'm just mentioning uh, two people, uh, Robert Nozick, the biggest, first biggest critic of Rawls, um, and also John Kikas. He has books, if you look down there, against liberalism, the illusions of egalitarianism, um, he says, Kikis, for example, and I think that's quite interesting. He says, people don't have equal moral value. People don't have equal dignity. There are people who, who habitually harm others. Why <laughs> should we say that these people have equal moral values than people who don't do this or people even who habitually help others? Why should we say everyone has the same moral dignity? All right. Um, I'm talking very briefly, and I think it's time for the first break and for the first round of, of questions. Let me see where we are here. Yeah, I'm, I'm moving very, very fast. We're in five minutes, we'll be done uh, with the section on, on justice. But let me just talk for a few minutes on a very important disagreement in political philosophy. There is John Rawls. And there is the proportionalist Robert Nozick, who wrote the book Anarchy, State, and Utopia. And uh, Rawls is defending the welfare state. Um, Nozick is defending the minimal state. And I'm giving you just a very, in a nutshell, the arguments here. Um, Rawls says, look, if you are born in a privileged family, if you were lucky in the natural lottery, if you got all these wonderful genes and you have all these talents, uh, he says, you don't deserve this, right? You don't deserve your place. If you're born in a, in a well-connected, wealthy family, you don't deserve all your talents. And so he says, as we don't deserve this, we should give compensation. So that's how he, he justifies in a nutshell, uh, the welfare state. And, and Nozick says, but come on, um, we are, we still rightfully own our talents. Why should I uh, give half of the fruit of my labor uh, to others? Um, and, and that's a big disagreement on, on justice and contemporary uh, justice. Just one famous quote by Nozick here in the middle in the second bullet point. He says, taxation of earnings from labor is on a par with forced labor. Some persons find this claim obviously true. Taking the earnings of n hours labor is like taking n hours from the person. It is like forcing the person to work n hours for another's purpose. Okay, um, so you see here is a disagreement about taxation. Um, it's a disagreement about property rights, um, and and yeah, neither Nozick uh, was convinced by by Rawls. And, and, and vice versa. So I basically think we cannot solve this disagreement and just, I'm not going into this. Also, it's not only that the proportionals disagree with, it, with each other, it's also that the egalitarians disagree with each other. And there was a big debate uh, and the headline here of this slide, the debate about the equality of what? What equality uh, do, do we want? Do we want equality of resources? Do we want equality of opportunity for welfare? Do we want equality of central capabilities? Uh, like Martha Nussbaum and Amartya Sen argue in their very interesting capabilities um, approach. All right, I'm stopping here. I stop sharing my screen.
screen and sorry for talking so long. Uh, so far, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Manuel, for this background. Uh, the floor is open to question. Uh, if you have any question concerning this section, uh, you can open your microphone and then you can ask your question or you can give you your remark. I, I, I have a question. This, uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Just it's a clarificatory question. Just the way you've presented uh, the what you call the consensus camp seem to strongly emphasize the idea that the consensus is achievable. This is an in fact consensus. However, many of, I mean, some at least would say that you don't, it's not that the consensus is something that we can actually reach. It's just some sort of a normative idea that even if we can never reach, we have to keep striving towards it. And that can guide the way we you know, conduct our disagreements, which it can do it in a way that is very, let's say in contradistinction, contradistinction with someone who would say, okay, forget about consensus. I'm here to fight my grounds. I'll draw my boundaries and things can escalate towards more of a conflictual. So there seems to be a value in the consensus, even if it is not achievable. I wonder if this is something you, maybe later you take into account, I don't know. No, thank you very much for this. This is a very, very good point. And, and of course, to, to clarify uh, this, where the consensus is just like a regulative idea in the language of Kant, if it's just an, an ideal, which we can never reach, if it's just some like something that gives us orientation, something towards which we should strive. Um, I think that's clearly, it makes a lot of sense. To, to interpret this this way. And that of course would mean uh, that I was presenting the, the positions of, of Habermas and Rawls as kind of too strong. But, but, but I think of course now we would have to sit down and, and read their, their, their texts and look at all the different passages. Um, I would still claim that, um, that my, I'm not misrepresenting them because Rawls, for example, in the theory of justice, he clearly says, yes, um, if we have this um, fair initial situation, the, the original position, if we have the veil of ignorance, if you know uh, not whether we come from a rich or poor family, what our talents are, he still claims if we have a list um, of, 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 of con conceptions of justice, utilitarianism, et cetera, et cetera, he still claims that clearly people would choose his two principles. I mean, he's, he says the overlapping consensus in his later works, he says, this is something really reachable. Um, so so, so I, I think, um, sure, it would be, let's say a weak interpretation of these consensus theoreticians you are, you're, you're suggesting, but, but I would claim there is textual evidence that they mean consensus. It's the power of reason, right, for them. It's the power of reason that allows us to reach uh, a, a consensus. And, and I think uh, that is not, um, not appropriate. Let's say, I'm, let, I'm working now on another paper uh, about Nietzsche and deep disagreements. I think we have to see uh, that after Copernicus, after the enlightenment, after Freud, after Darwin, especially, I think our view of human reason has changed quite a bit. Um, you know, whatever, is it just an instrument for survival? For Plato and Aristotle, our reason is a divine element. We live in a divinely ordered cosmos. And, and so is reason, there is a, in, it, in the Italian philosophy, there is il pensiero debole, the, the weak thought. We can only interpret things, Nietzsche's, perspectivism. I think Nietzsche, uh, I, sorry, I think um, we have to revise our view of reason. Reason is not as powerful uh, as Kant still thought uh, and as Kantians still think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Further question? 
Uh, Eylül Zeynep, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure about uh, whether we are going to talk about this later or, or not, but uh, here, here, is, here is my question. So as far as I understand what you're saying that uh, there are very different values and one can choose between uh, them how to act. For example, I can act according to my religious values or national values, et cetera, et cetera. So this creates a deep, some kind of deep disagreement that we cannot choose. So um, if this is the case uh, in political and ethical realm uh, and most of our social lives, uh, there, are most, uh, there are lots of different opinions and ideas that we cannot choose because people act according to different values. So saying that these disagreements cannot be solved, um, I'm wondering what's the implication of that? What should we do? We should, should we like say, stop saying anything or should we, um, so I'm asking about the implication. And also I want to say that in practical life, it seems that we choose one side at least. In political realm, for example, we choose um, some, of, some of the um, theories and act accordingly. So yeah, that's my question. Yeah, thank you. A very, very important question. And, and, and I think if we agree uh, that there, our disagreements about values. If we agree that I will never come around to your secular values or that you never come around to my Christian or whatever uh, values. If we, if we say, okay, we, we have to live with this, right? We have to live with these disagreements um, uh, uh, about values. I think then um, if consensus is uh, uh, not even a realistic ideal, if consensus is something we, we cannot even hope for, uh, then I think we have to cope with these values. And here, um, I think we need virtues. You know, that's kind of, you're, I'm anticipating the part of the ethics of disagreement. For example, we need the virtue of tolerance. You know, tolerance is exactly uh, relevant if I don't agree with you, right? If I if I have the same idea as you, if I believe the same religion as you, or in no religion as you, it's no problem. We only need tolerance if we not only disagree, but we even think you're wrong, and 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 what you believe is dangerous. Uh, what you believe is questioning my views. So tolerance, if we we need tolerance, first of the first step of tolerance is we say no, we don't like this, we 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 reject this. But then there is something that makes us say, I, I accept it anyway. Uh, you know, peaceful living together with, with people who, who we disagree with. How do we, how can we live together if we are not tolerant? If, uh, if I know you, you have a different view of mine, uh, but you know, I think first of all, we should stop uh, understanding why. You know, that's one part of my research. Why do we disagree? Uh, why do we have different values? And there are lots of answers and there are also some answers in the literature. But if we acknowledge that the, these deep disagreements um, exist, if they're, let's say, like what I said in the last, to answer to the last question, if they're, our reason is not as powerful, uh, if, if, if we, um, then I think we should say, okay, I accept, I don't think the others are all ignorant and all idiotic and all backwards. Um, they're just different views. So I think it's so important to study disagreement because it can help us to respect those with who we, we disagree. And if we respect them, we probably start fighting <laughs> against them. We probably start accepting that pluralism, plural value pluralism is, is a fact of uh, the, the, the modern world. And, and you know, also Rawls, for example, he says there is value pluralism. People have different ideas of the good life. And then Rawls' first move is to say, okay, um, we have to be tolerant towards these values, but he thinks we can at least still agree on a just political framework in, in which we, this, we can live this value pluralism. But of course, if we disagree about what is a just uh, political framework, how many taxes are, are, are just, we will keep on, on disagreeing. I hope this answers a little bit your question. 
Okay, thank you. Any other question? Uh, if you don't, uh, I can ask uh, uh, two questions. One is a small question. The other is maybe <laughs> a little bit uh, difficult question. Uh, the small question is that, uh, Manuel, do you uh, uh, differentiate the concept compromise from the concept consensus? Definitely, yes. This is the uh, first question and why. And uh, the second question, uh, do you think there is a deep uh, disagreement uh, in uh, especially uh, social, political area, et cetera? But you- oh, Sorry, say this again, a thick disagreement? Deep, deep, a deep disagreement, the title uh -huh. of your uh, uh -huh. talk. But uh, you emphasize especially the, uh, the adjective deep, you know, yeah, there is disagreement. Why you uh, consider the, the, the uh, disagreement as deep dis uh, disagreement? You know, gotcha. when we uh, look at the uh, history of the philosophy, of course, we see uh, some uh, disagreement and also we see agreement. Uh, you know, uh, maybe like uh, Hegel said, uh, there is, uh, you know, the whole, uh, each philosophical system see just uh, one aspect of uh, whole reality or whole truth. Maybe there is a, you know, basic uh, agreement. I mean, the basic truth, just we see uh, one aspect of this truth uh, and other uh, philosophers see another aspect of truth. Why do you think uh, the, uh, you know, the agreement is deep agreement? Okay. Disagreement, sorry. Thank you, I totally understand your questions. They are very good. Uh, the first question, um, is there a distinction between consensus and compromise? Yes. yes. Uh, and I think it's very important to emphasize compromise because if we cannot reach consensus, <laughs> We have to be more modest in our goals. And I think we should look for compromise. So I think kind of emphasizing compromise, and there's also some recent work in political philosophy done on compromise. For example, Fabian Wendt uh, has a nice book on this. Um, I think we need compromise. I think that's a way how to deal with deep disagreements. Let's take the Turkish context. Um, the, the so-called secular camp um, said, we cannot tolerate headscarves. So they said, we don't let your child study in the university if you, if you wear a headscarf. So that's intolerance. Uh, now the, the ruling camp says, well, alcohol, we, we don't like alcohol, don't drink alcohol uh, in the public. We make laws, we, we raise the taxes, etc. So, you know, both camps are fighting uh, uh, against each other, but very likely, at some point, the other camp will rule and then the other camp will rule. So I think we need a compromise here, right? We say, okay, I give you this, I give you that. I tolerate your drinking and I tolerate your, your religious, your head or whatever it is. So I, th I think we need compromise. I think compromise is the way forward. Uh, compromise is how to overcome the disagreements. Okay, second question, um, yes philosophy. I personally think uh, philosophy is the business of deep disagreement. Philosophy yeah. is, um, you know, Protagoras, he says, value relativism. Then Plato says, he, I, he fought all his life with Protagoras. He says, oh, no, no, it's not all relative. There is uh, the divine form of the good. There is the divine form of justice. And then comes Aristotle and says, Oh, these forms, <laughs> uh, the, the, they just exist in Plato's fantasy. Um, so, so, so I think there is, and you know, the philosophers, they have time to sit down to think about 20 years um, about a topic and, and they exchange the arguments. They read uh, the professional philosophers. They have decades to read the arguments of the people. But I think philosophy is the business of disagreement. I mean, of course, I'm not saying uh, we cannot reach uh, some, some disagreements, uh, some agreements we cannot, but you know, you have in epistemology, you have the camp of 
the empiricists uh, versus the camp of the rationalists. And they're still fighting uh, over who is right. There is, in ethics, you have the camp of the consequentialists and the deontologists. Uh, so, so, so I don't think that um, there are some agreements. And I think, again, Nietzsche is very interesting here, uh, also in the context of what you said. Uh, yes, sure, we always have some limited perspectives. And if we can gain other, more perspectives, uh, the closer probably we come to something like objectivity. There is such a thing like Nietzsche says, with more eyes, we, if we can have more eyes to see something, if we have more perspective, uh, we can probably agree. You know, it's, I'm not also not saying that it's impossible. It's, I'm not saying it's futile. It's not saying it's a waste of time because sometimes I can come around to your position. But I think it's very important, first of all, that we open up to listen to others. I think, you know, now I'm organizing with a colleague from Tilburg University, we're organizing a workshop on the ethics of conversation and disagreement, June 18, uh, 19. And I think we have to talk about this. You know, usually we read our blog, we read our newspaper, and, and we say, yeah, the people who think differently from us, they are whatever, they are idiots, or, or at least they are not well informed, or they have some cognitive flaw. But I think they don't have this, right? I think we should read the newspaper of the other camp. Uh, we should discuss with the other camp, and I'm sure in some aspects we will be convinced um, of the other positions, or at least we will be able to understand the other position better, and, and, and therefore also be more tolerant uh, towards it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Sure. Okay, further question? If we don't, uh, any question, we can pass to the second section, Manuel, if you want. Of course. Hold on. I think there is. Uh, Karen, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, thanks for the nice discussion. Uh, I had a question regarding the basic concept of deep disagreement. Uh, I, I was wondering, uh, how do you recognize uh, deep disagreement? Uh, because sometimes it might be the case that if you keep arguing, maybe at some point, maybe it may take 10 years or 100 years or even 1,000 years, uh, maybe at some point you will agree that these two parties may agree. So how, in, how do you recognize a deep disagreement, whether a disagreement is deep or not? Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Thank you so much uh, uh, for this. Um, that's very difficult uh, to answer. Let's take my topic from my last section, justice. Now philosophers have been talking uh, 2,500 years about justice. They've been exchanging arguments. You know, I'm defining a deep disagreement is a disagreement that you cannot solve through exchanging reasons and arguments. And there is still no consensus in philosophy. You still have the proportionalists, you still have the egalitarians. So, so, so you know, I'm not saying it's completely impossible, but I'm saying like if you have a, a, a discussion which is going on for 2000, 500 years and, and, and no one came around to the position of uh, the others, then I think at this point, it seems likely to say it's a deep disagreement. That's my first answer. The second answer, and that's kind of research uh, in progress. Um, if we understand the reasons for the deep disagreements, why, if we understand better human reason, why human reason is limited, why human reason um, comes to different concepts. Probably then, if we have a better understanding of the causes of the sources of these deep disagreements, then probably we can also be more certain to say, okay, at this point, it makes no sense to continue the discussion because we can already forecast that no one will come around uh, to the other position. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, further question? I think there is no further question, Manuel. Okay. 
Okay, if you want, we can pass to next section. Sure, I want. How much time do we have, Erdal? Uh, still, we have one hour. Okay, that's good. Yeah, until uh, 5 p.m. We have Okay, time. okay. That was the biggest section, so I'm moving now. We will also, you're getting, we're all getting tired. Now the next session will be much shorter than the one before. Hold on, I'm sharing my screen. Can you all see this? Yeah. Very good. I just have to move. Okay. Yeah. Deep disagreements on values and moral issues. Now I'm coming more towards the sociological um, realm. Unfortunately, my colleague from the sociology department, she had to leave. She already told me before because she has the service at four o'clock. Um, yeah, I'm talking about two uh, authors who I think are very interesting uh, for the topic, deep disagreements on values, uh, Max Weber and Yesire Berlin. So Max Weber and Yesire Berlin argue that deep disagreements on values exist. Weber goes back to Nietzsche, Berlin goes back to Machiavelli. Okay, value conflicts, what are examples? Values that clash in principle. Liberty versus equality, two of the three big values of the French Revolution. To illustrate this in a few simple terms, if you want more equality, very likely you have to limit liberty. If you have more liberty, um, very likely you have less equality. Let's say if everyone, um, there is a, the famous Will Chamberlain um, example in, in Robert Nozick's uh, book, he says like, if you want equality, uh, you have to restrict liberty because you know, if the baseball fans um, all paid 75 cents extra to see Will Chamberlain play, um, very soon Will Chamberlain will be very rich um, and so you will have huge uh, inequality. So, so, so Robert Nozick, he argues um, against uh, egalitarians and he says, if you want equality, you have to restrict uh, liberty. So here is a, is a conflict. The second example, um, loyalty towards the nation versus loyalty towards the cosmos, the cosmopolitan view, I've already explained this. Another one which you haven't mentioned, uh, before the life of the fetus and the liberty of a woman, a woman uh, who, who wants an abortion, who says, I'm not ready uh, to have a child. Uh, she says, yeah, my liberty is such an important value. And, and, and this value is clashing with the value of the life of a fetus and how you will uh, solve this uh, value conflict will of course also depend on when you say, when does life start? And, and do you believe that some soul is entering the fertilized egg or not? So these are some, some examples, but of course there are so many other uh, value uh, conflicts and deep disagreements on values. Weber, uh, Weber on the argumentative limits of the social sciences and ethics, he's not using the term deep disagreements, um, but uh, in principle, he's talking about exactly these deep disagreements. Max Weber and Messiah Berlin both argue that there is no possibility to rationally arbitrate between values or to rationally resolve value conflicts. For Weber, no ultimate rational grounding of values, norms, or ideals is possible. He emphasizes the limits of ethics and defense decisionism. He says, you have to uh, make uh, a decision. You cannot uh, ethically solve uh, all, all, all the conflicts. Um, a nice quote of Weber about the limits of the social sciences. He says, even such simple questions as the extent to which an end, a good end, we could say, should sanction unavoidable means or the extent to which undesired repercussions should be taken into consideration, or how conflicts between several concretely conflicting ends are to be arbitrated, 
are entirely matters of choice or compromise. And now comes the most important phrase of the quote, there is no rational or empirical scientific procedure of any kind whatsoever, which can provide us with a decision here. So let's take uh, an example like humanitarian intervention. Um, if you want to stop Hitler uh, and you, you bomb Dresden, uh, how, many, how many civilians um, should you be killing in order to stop Hitler's crimes? And I think no ethics will be able uh, to give you an answer there. And people will disagree. Some people will say you should not kill anyone. Um, it's not, not up to us to interfere in, in such a situation. OK, I'm moving on to Messiah Berlin on value conflicts. Um, despite Berlin's view that values are objective, he holds that they clash frequently. He says, the normal human situation is that ends equally ultimate, equally sacred, and entire systems of value do come into collision without possibility of rational arbitration. So, so Berlin and, and, and Weber are kind of uh, precursors of uh, a thought on, on deep disagreements. Um, according to Berlin, I'm keeping, keep reading here, um, values can clash or be incompatible between cultures or groups in the same culture or between you and me. Also, values may easily clash within the breast of a single individual. Berlin exemplifies value conflicts with some who believe, someone, sorry, who believes in always telling the truth and someone who believes that this can sometimes be too painful and too destructive. Now we're entering uh, the camp of ethics. Let's talk talk about a deep disagreement in ethics. There, in uh, normative ethics um, or ethical theory, there are three main theories, uh, well, uh, virtue ethics, deontological ethics, and a consequentialist approach. I will explain uh, this. We're just looking at the conflict between or the clash between a deontological and a consequentialist approach to ethics. Someone should probably turn off the microphone. Uh, if you have questions later, please turn it back on. But for now, I think it would be good if everyone else could, could turn off the microphone. Um, so Berlin's example, should we always tell the truth or is it sometimes too painful to tell uh, the truth, illustrates a more profound and general conflict between two main approaches to morality and ethics between a deontological and a consequentialist approach. A deontological ethics here is some quick definitions. Uh, um, a deontological ethics claims certain actions are always right or wrong in certain situations, no matter what the consequences are. Immanuel Kant is a famous representative of such an ethics. He says, lying is always wrong, uh, stealing is always wrong. A consequentialist ethics, on the contrary, holds that the judgment about the moral rightness or wrongness of an action depends exclusively on the quality of the foreseeable consequences. So if the, co if the consequences are good, um, then it's okay uh, to lie. I have the example of Robin Hood. Stealing is wrong, but Robin Hood steals in order to save uh, the poor from starving. And in this case, if you look at the consequences um, from the perspective of a consequentialist ethics, it is right to steal. For the perspective of a deontological ethics, it is wrong. And you know, also there have been so many, so much literature, so many discussions. So I think um, maybe now the consequentialist camp uh, is in the lead. Um, but there's still, uh, of course, also John Rawls, he's also defending uh, as a Kantian a deontological um, ethics. Um, Weber, by the way, talks about the same uh, topic, just he uses a different uh, terminology. Um, 
Next uh, bullet point, he says, Weber conceptualizes the deep disagreement between the mentioned two clashing approaches to ethics as a conflict between an ethics of responsibility uh, and an ethics of conviction. So um, that is an ethics of responsibility. That's a consequentialist or utilitarian ethics and an ethics of conviction. That's a deontological ethics. A deontological and a consequentialist approach to ethics are irreconcilably opposed to each other. They do not allow for consensus or compromise. These are my thesis. Rather, they require a choice about whether actions or consequences are the appropriate domain of ethical assessment. No rational procedure exists in other thesis that allows for a decision on whether to prefer a deontological or a consequentialist approach to ethics and morality. Last, um, last uh, slide to this, and then we can make another break for, for, for questions. So the thesis is the clash between a deontological and a consequentialist approach to ethics is a central reason for deep disagreements on moral issues. If there are two opposing domains of ethical assessment, action versus consequences, and if there is no rational procedure to decide which one to prefer, you may have deep dis you have you have many sorry deep disagreements on moral issues. You know, by example, for Robin Hood, stealing is right. For Kant and the so-called Abrahamic religions, it is always wrong. You know, uh, Moses receives uh, the Ten Commandments, six are, uh, have an ethical contents, do not lie, do not steal, etc. Okay, um, that was a bit shorter. I'm stopping to, to share my screen and I'm looking forward to more questions. Erdal. Did we lose our moderator? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to open my microphone. Sorry, I think there are some questions. Uh, yeah, please, uh, uh, Victoria Holberg. Uh, um, Hi. Hopefully I'm seeing correctly. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Uh, Victoria okay. Holbrook. Hi, Manuel. Hi, uh, I was, uh, I'm new to this. Uh, it seemed to me, and maybe this is wrong, that you were saying that Weber differs, that Berlin differs from Weber because he believes there is an objective right uh, decision, but, you, but he agrees with Weber in that there's no ra rational procedure to arrive at it. Is that the case? Yes, uh, Berlin clearly says values are objective but despite their objectivity, they can clash. Mm -hmm. So he says liberty and equality are objective values, but they're still um, have, there's a confrontation. And, there's and, a possibility, and, yeah. And, and there's and no rational solution. There is no rational uh, solution, exactly. I mean, and you know, Weber, he, he, he says, um, we have to make a decision here. Weber is clearly a decisionist. He says, as we cannot rationally uh, resolve this, uh, we will have to make all our decisions and we're kind of responsible uh, for, for, for these decisions. And, and, and very likely you will maybe decide differently uh, uh, th th than me. But you know, we, we will have to, yeah, his, that's his solution. We have to, to, to make it decide for the one or the other. And what does Berlin say? Well, Berlin, he he just says we cannot. Yeah, he yes. pretty much he says pretty much the same actually. He 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 also says we um, we always have to make these hard choices, either this way or, or that way. You know, even if we say both liberty and equality uh, is a value, we can maybe find a compromise, right? We have some equality um, and and therefore restrict liberty to some to some extent. Um, but you know, there is no whatever scientific procedure that, that, that tells us and very likely people will keep disagreeing because you know, for example, Rawls, Rawls and Nozick, right? Kind of, Nozick is saying, oh, Rawls um, 
is, is, is violating my property uh, rights and my liberty to, to, to become richer than, than, than others. And, 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 and Rawls says, no, we, we, we need more equality in, in, for example, in section 17 of the theory of justice, he talks about the tendency towards equality and he, we have to compensate and get rid of uh, these, these inequalities. So I, what I was wondering is, uh, is there any non-theological argument for a, a way of decision that is other than rational? Sorry, could you say this in different words? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the problem is there's no rational, there's no scientific procedure. There's no, you know, according to the logic as we believe in it today, right? I mean, because logic has changed a great deal over the centuries. People have critiqued ancient, you know, Aristotle's logic or Plato's logic, whatever. And, and fuzzy but, logic today. <laughs> yes, well, we don't, you know, logic is not eternal, uh, apparently. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, it our, our perception of it changes. Um, so I was just wondering if there was a non-theological argument for a way to decide between uh, objectively true values, objectively there, or existent values, that does not require a rational argument. Is there anything like that? Oh, you're looking for some very interesting region, but but, <laughs> I, but I have to say I don't see it. Right? You have in theology, you have kind of you have the authority, you have the authority of the scriptures, you have the authority of the revelation. But of course, your authority is different uh, than my authority. And there are religions like Buddhism that don't even have a god, and and, and that's difficult. And of course, you have whatever. Um, powerful um, heads of states who say, okay, that is uh, the right way. I, I personally think, you know, I, I said maybe you were, were you already there when I talked about the limits of reason. I think we, we should not give up reason. I think we should not, um, but we should be aware that reason is, is not such uh, a strong authority uh, than we think. We have to, I think we need a more let's say, realistic view of mm -hmm. the powers of human reason. But, you know, I'm not saying uh, we should give up reason. I think we should keep discussing. We should try to understand each other. But I think we should do this with a different spirit. We should know our limits. Uh, we, we, we should know uh, that we are just like, uh, we're not the center of the universe, right? Uh, our brothers and sisters are, are monkeys. Um, so, 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 you know, and, and that changes the view of, sure. of, of the powers of reason. And I think uh, we have to, you know, Freud talks about the, 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 the three uh, outrages or however it's, it's, it's translated, the three mortifications. Um, and also he says, yeah, psychoanalysis showed us that the eye is not the master in its own house. <laughs> and, 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 and I think we have to, even if it hurts our self-love, right? I, I think we have to fully embrace uh, these, these scientific developments. And, 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 and I hope this will make us more tolerant. I hope this will, will, will we will keep discussing, but probably with less hope uh, that we come around to each other's. But, you know, I don't see a, a, a different way, you know, I'm the, the path you're, you're no. I don't I'm know. I was just wondering if anyone had suggested it. By the way, I'm sorry, I mixed up this talk of yours with the one that's coming in a couple of weeks, and I thought it started at four, so that's why I was leaving. Oh, oh, we still have 40 minutes left. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, Eylül Zeynep wants to ask a question, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, as far as again, I understand you are saying that since the ontology and um, uh, utilitarianism clash too much, they have some principles that uh, when we apply them, we have some contradictory norms. So this is why we cannot say that one of them is objectively true. Uh, this is right, right? <laughs> so, sorry, say this again, please. So the ontology and utilitarianism have some principles that we, when we apply them, uh, we reach some contradictory norms. Yes, so we, they have different domains of assessment. The, 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 the yeah. ontologists say we have to just look at the action 
and limit ourselves to the action and the consequentialist says the action is not so important. We have to look at the consequences. Can we save yeah. lives? If we can do this, we can lie, we can rob or something others. Mm -hmm. And uh, based on this, I can, we cannot still say that um, even if we cannot point out to an objective moral principle, we cannot say that morality demands objectively or when we are making a moral claim, we are not, uh, we are talking about uh, a claim that is applicable for everyone and that is true for everyone. For example, when you say that we should be tolerant to each other, you don't mean that some of us should be tolerant to each other, but some of us not. So still we are acting like, or we are assuming that your claim we should be tolerant to each other is objective and universally applicable. Uh, so it, um, I think the clash between the ontology and utilitarianism is about a problem about normative ethics. Maybe the, the guidebook for morality doesn't work, but this does not mean that morality objectively, uh, morality is itself an objective discipline. So um, yeah, this is my question. Yeah. Isn't that like well, a, uh, let me, yeah. I hope I understood it uh, yeah. correctly. Um, I think you know, these two approaches to ethics, it's a clash about what is right. Uh, the deontologist says it's never right to lie. It's never right to steal. And the consequentialist says, no, this is wrong because there are situations, uh, if we can produce good consequences, in these situations, it's clearly right to lie uh, and to steal. And um, so, so that is a question, you know, they can discuss with each other and they can try to convince uh, each other, you know, the consequentialist uh, will say, but look, um, Robin Hood, he saved these poor people from, from, from starving. And, and, and the deontologist will, 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 will still say, but, but he steals, steals is wrong. It's not up to him. He should leave the consequences to God or whatever uh, the, the deontologist uh, uh, will say. The, the deontologist will say, these are the principles, these are the ideals. You should never violate certain, uh, certain ideals. Uh, now, if you bring in tolerance, and I'm not sure whether I understood uh, this part, are you saying should the deontologist be tolerant? Can the deontologist be tolerant towards the consequentialists and vice versa? Or no, I'm just saying that um, the clash between utilitarianism and uh, deontology uh, about there are no objective moral principles. Uh, we cannot derive uh, this derive from this that there are no uh, morality is not objective. So I'm saying that even if they clash, you are still claiming that we should be tolerant to each other and you mean that as an objective and universal thing. Well, I, to tell you the truth, I don't believe that morality is objective. <laughs> so so I, I think, yeah, we will find lots of similarities. Probably we find also some agreements that we all say it's wrong uh, to kill someone without any good reasons. Or, or something maybe Ted Bundy uh, would, would, would argue, and there are some tapes um, of, of him where he says, yeah, we're also eating animals and we're just like animals. So why shouldn't we uh, eat each other or, or, or something? But, you know, I, I personally have a problem to say morality is, is objective. You know, I will talk about this in the, in the session, section on meta ethics. I don't think there are objective Values. I don't think there is an objective moral uh, reality. I think we have different moral intuitions. And, and clearly the moral intuition of the deontologist clashes with the moral intuition of the utilitarian or with the consequentialist. But, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, no one, we cannot say who is right, right? I think there is, um, I don't know whether I'm answering your question. I'm sorry. I'm, Okay, maybe uh, after listening to the last section, it will be more clear for me. Thank yeah, you. probably you can come back to the point after the, the meta ethics section. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, is there any question, further question? Actually, I have some question, but uh, I prefer waiting for the last section. <laughs> Okay, I think there is no further question. Uh, so if you want, we can pass to the, the last and the end. Uh, Actually, there are two more. 
Two? Okay. <laughs> Two more sec, but I, I will okay. try. I, I look on my watch and uh, hold on. Let me just, okay, here. So I think um, from what we've talked about so far, um, I think there is a very important research question. Essential, I'm reading my, my slide. Essential question for future research on deep disagreements on values, justice, and moral issues. What are the reasons for deep disagreements on values, justice, and moral issues? So I think, you know, in ethics and or else in political philosophy, there are constantly political philosophers who are suggesting a new normative. Uh, political theory, like do we need equality of capabilities? Do we need equality of, of resources? Um, and I think we should shift uh, the, 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 of our research and, and, and should ask more about this. At least that's what I'm doing uh, for, for, for some years in which I will keep uh, doing. And um, I'm, I'm so very quickly, I guess we have still three more sections, I'm just realizing. I just give you just very quickly some, some answers, some possible answers to okay. this uh, research question. And I promised you at the beginning, uh, uh, Robert Fogelin and his text, The Logic of Deep Disagreement, to, to quickly introduce this, this view. Um, and I would say Fogelin has a foundationalist approach to explaining deep disagreements on moral issues. Robert Fogelin explains deep disagreements, for example, about abortion. It's one of the examples he's using by attributing them to irreconcilable belief systems on which such disagreements are based. Disagreements about abortion often occur between people who adhere to Christian faith and a Christian view of the soul, you know, the soul comes uh, when the egg is fertilized, uh, and people who do not. Um, so Fögelin's Wittgensteinian and foundationalist approach conceives of those belief systems that framework propositions or underlying principles that clash. And um, in one of my latest uh, texts, I used uh, this, this, this approach um, to, to, to explain the, the, the disagreement between Plato and, and Protagoras. Protagoras is a religious skeptic. He says, about the gods, I know nothing, whether they exist uh, or how their form is or whether they don't exist. And Plato is clearly, and he says, manage the measure of all things. And, and, and Plato is clearly a religious thinker. He says, God is the measure of all things. So we can derive certain disagreements, for example, about abortion, we can derive them from more basic uh, underlying principles, from more basic worldviews um, uh, that clash. So, so that is one, what, one approach, and that is clearly Fogelin's approach, which we could call a foundationalist approach. Other reasons, other possibilities, there's more. I just put together a few to, to show some ways we could probably um, go in order to tackle with the problem. Um, the Marxist approach would be justice, uh, about, again, disagreements about justice. Justice is based on one's own particular interests or on class interests. So we can explain disagreements about justice that we belong to a different class, that we have different interests, and these interests make us uh, come to different conclusions. And interestingly, uh, John Rawls seems to acknowledge this because when he comes up with the veil of ignorance, uh, which is basically an information deficit, so he says principles of justice should be chosen out of the list uh, under a veil of ignorance. We don't know which class we belong to. We don't know who our parents are. We don't know uh, how intelligent we are. So, so, so that seems to be one explanation. Another explanation which goes in, in the direction of my, 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 my contemporary research is a cognitive approach. And it's very interesting that already Rawls has this. He talks about the burdens of just ju judgment. He says, it's not so easy to, to make judgments and to agree of, in our judgments uh, because there are these burdens of judgment. I will explain this in a minute. Um, I think what's also very uh, a good explanation for opposing 
uh, for opposing views is that we have opposing images of humanity. Probably we all agree that humans are equal and unequal. They are equal they, because we all belong to the same species. We all, we are born, we die, uh, but we are clearly also unequal. We have different talents. Uh, some people are stronger. Uh, some people are better at math. And I think um, if we emphasize more the, the aspects in which we are equal, um, uh, then we come to a different view of what is just than if we emphasize more our inequalities. If you look at ancient philosophy, um, the, the, the sophists, you know, Noberto Bobbio, he has this text left and right. We have sophists on the left, like um, Callicles or Trasumachos, who emphasize individual differences and say, yeah, therefore, there should be also inequality in the political system and in what people uh, deserve. Other sophists like Antiphon uh, say, yeah, we have all the same needs. We need to breathe the air, we, we need food. And then they say, as we're all equal, we, we, we need also social and political um, equality. So I think uh, some of the disagreements, again, we can derive them from, from a different, more foundational level. So to make it more simple, disagreements Many disagreements on justice can be derived from disagreements on whether to emphasize more the equality of humans or more the inequality of humans. And the third one, the fourth one, sorry, uh, D here on the slide, um, people disagree with each other on justice because no moral knowledge exists. And that's already kind of here, we're entering very soon the debate on, on, on meta ethics. Let's say there was, there were Plato's form of the good. And Plato were able to show us, uh, to see the form of the good. Um, we wouldn't have to listen to him personally. We could just read his texts and we could somehow clearly see uh, the form of the good. Then we would stop disagreeing, uh, but we don't see it. And all the people who claim there is this objective moral reality. There are these uh, objective values. They were not able to convince the people who say there are no such objective values. So, so we keep disagreeing. Um, and that's, I think, a strong explanation uh, because moral facts and moral knowledge do not exist. I will talk a bit more about this when we come to the section on meta ethics. Let's talk for a moment about the burdens of justice, um, judgment, why I'm saying all this justice, uh, because that's very interesting because that now we're talking about human reason. How, what's an adequate picture of, of human reason? Um, John Rawls in his later work, uh, Political Liberalism from uh, 1992, 21 years after a theory of justice, he, he admits that there are reasonable disagreements. He says there are reasonable disagreements on religious, philosophical, and moral views. And he names the sources or causes of these reasonable disagreements, which are disagreements between reasonable people. Um, and he says the sources are the burdens of judgment. Um, and Rawls elucidates the burdensome conditions under which many of our important judgments are made by presenting an incomplete and open list. I'm summarizing this here in my own words. Um, he says, evidence is difficult to evaluate. The overall weight of the manifold relevant normative considerations on both sides of an issue is hard to assess. Our concepts are vague and therefore we must rely on interpretations and judgments about interpretations. Our moral and political adjustments are shaped by our disparate, disparate life experiences. It is difficult to select among, among our moral and political values and to prioritize them. So, so you know, the later roles uh, becomes a theoretician uh, about, about deep disagreements. Um, but um, my thesis against, against Rawls is the existence of deep disagreements on justice, uh, which Rawls, and the burdens of judgment, which Rawls admits unintentionally undermine 
was is that a rational agreement on principles of social justice is possible and that an overlapping consensus on a liberal political conception of justice can be reached uh, or can be achieved. So Rawls says, yes, look here are the burdens of judgment. It's so difficult to make a judgment we come up, we have different judgments, we end up having different judgments. But he says these, these burdens of judgment, they are only relevant for religious disagreements, for moral disagreements and for philosophical disagreements. But he seems to uh, not acknowledge that uh, these burdens of judgment also make an agreement on justice possible, as, as he claims. So I think he unintentionally undermines his own uh, consensus uh, position by introducing these burdens of judgment. And, and like he has this blind spot and says, yeah, the burdens of judgment don't apply to, to, to disagreements on judgment. And I think these burdens of judgment, I think that's the direction in which we should keep um, doing research uh, because the existence of deep disagreements on justice and the burdens of justice judgment undermine also Habermas central claim that unimpeded discourse and arguments based on communicative reason are generally able to solve disagreements and lead to consensus in moral issues. And my research thesis actually I'm writing these days about this, I have till the 15th. Uh, I think we need a post-religious and post-metaphysical and rather naturalist view of human reason based on that we are on Darwin's uh, insights that we cannot easily say, yeah, the re it's a divine, reason is a divine element in, in, in human beings. And I think if we, if we come up with a different view on, on reason, I think Nietzsche has a lot, Freud has a lot to offer here, then I think we can also better explain deep disagreements on values, justice, and moral issues. Yeah, now finally, quickly, meta-ethics, it will be done in five minutes, and then we can make another break. I know listening is much harder than talking. Um, I've been talking quite long now. Um, okay, what is meta-ethics? I'm trying to, because not everyone is familiar uh, with this concept and it's not always easy to grasp it. Uh, we have to understand there was a linguistic turn in the philosophy of the 20th century. Um, and that led to this new branch of moral philosophy called meta-ethics. This new discipline does not defend any normative principles or ethical theories like consequentialism or deontology does, but investigates the nature of morality and the meaning of moral statements and judgments. Yeah, the linguistic term, what do we mean if we say this is right or wrong? Are we referring to some moral facts? Are we just expressing our emotions? Um, what do we mean when we claim that something is right, good or just? Are we referring to moral facts and moral truth as Plato claims? Or do we just express our personal feelings, thoughts and attitudes? Or do we express our societies? values and attitudes, our religious, religion's values and attitudes. Metaethics analyzes more than just moral language and arguments. It also analyzes the ontological and epistemological questions connected to them. You know, epistemological questions, are there moral truths? Um, uh, if the forms exist, um, what is their ontological status how should we if they're really part of the world if they're part of the universe even if it's their only part of the cognitive universe so so what's their ontological status so that's i think a very interesting uh, new field in 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 ethics as a sub-discipline of ethics just very simply the most important terms um, we have the ethical realists versus the ethical anti-realists. I came to the conclusion because of the existence of these deep disagreements that could not have been overcome so far, I think we have to be anti-realists. Okay, um, just to explain the terms and contemporary meta-ethics definitions, Moral realism or ethical realism is strangely uh, the position that 
claims that moral facts and objective moral reality or objective moral values exist in mind independent ways. Think of Plato's form uh, of the good that exists in mind independent view. Um, and yeah, I don't think it's very realistic to claim the existence of this, but now they have this term. The anti-realists deny this. They say there are no moral facts. There is no uh, objective moral uh, value. Um, Plato was an ethical realist who holds the good to be a moral fact or an objective moral reality. Protagoras, on the other hand, was an ethical anti-realist. Plato was also a cognitivist, that's another technical term, um, who holds that moral knowledge can be achieved about the good as moral fact or objective moral reality. Protagoras was a non-cognitivist. So um, how does the existence of widespread deep disagreements on justice, values, and moral issues, how does this affect um, our, the discussion of realists uh, versus anti-realists? I think the argument against ethical, I'm reading from the slide, the argument against ethical realism and cognitivism this talk has demonstrated, I hope, <laughs> the existence of deep disagreements on justice, values, and moral issues. This is significant for meta-ethics because the existence of such deep disagreements is a strong argument against ethical realism and cognitivism. More than 2,000 years, and that's the question, when should we finally say we have a deep disagreement? When should we uh, stop? expecting a rational solution of the disagreement. More than 2000 years of intense philosophical research on justice values and moral issues has neither uncovered objective truth about the matter nor led to any agreement among scholars. Looking at it the other way around, deep disagreements on justice values and moral issues exist because there is no moral reality and no moral facts. So if someone uh, claims this like Plato and could point to it and we could follow um, his, 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 his lead and we could see it, then we would stop uh, disagreeing, but we can't. Um, there is nothing in the world to back up one of the conflicting philosophical views on such issues and no procedure using moral facts to solve moral disagreements and to show that one view is wrong and one is right. Um, very interesting in this context, um, John Mackey uh, called in a book called Ethics, um, Inventing Right or Wrong. Um, he talks also about uh, moral relativism, um, he talks about, he has the argument from queerness, so he says, these, if these uh, moral facts exist, they're really queer, really strange uh, entities. What should we think of them? And, and he says, and how could we access them? I'm not going into uh, this, and I think it's time for another round of questions. Erdal, your microphone Thank is Thank you, Manuel, yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think there are some questions. Uh, as we wait, uh, let me ask my question. Uh, yeah, uh, please. Yeah, please. Uh, sorry, open your open your microphone, please. Uh, I couldn't remember your name, Honor Bilge, but your Nihat. name is not Honor Bilge. Nihat. Yeah. The microphone Nihat. is muted, Nihat. Yeah, now it's open. Yeah, please. Yes, I need it first to click from your side. Uh, as three philosophers, uh, maybe you can uh, you uh, can look into uh, the term of uh, contradiction and especially antagonist contradiction uh, with uh, Kant and with Hegel and also with Marx. I mean, for Marx it was of course important uh, that the antagonism between uh, 
two classes. So there is a, a philosophical, let's say, objective, at least, uh, research uh, possibility for uh, uh, the philosophical terminology to enrich the deep, uh, the deepness. Uh, deep is a metaphor and uh, maybe uh, just to be clarified with uh, the term of antagonism, antagonist, uh, things uh, that uh, values that uh, cannot be solved easy. I mean, the working class and is always wants higher uh, salaries or wages. Uh, of course, the capitalist uh, wants to pay less. I mean, there is no way that there is a consensus. And uh, this would be, but on the other hand, both of them cannot live together without each other. I mean, there is no way to get out of this problem by destroying the, the working class through the capitalist or uh, also, <laughs> some of the uh, uh, to wipe out the capital, some of the uh, practices uh, to wipe out the capital have led to disastrous results, uh, like in the Soviet Union, uh, 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 okay. and uh, the kind of despotism was uh, achieved at, at the end uh, by uh, some kind of bureaucracy. That is more similar to the uh, Egyptian pharaoh system than to uh, any kind of socialism or communism that Marx had in mind. But uh, this is now something else. Uh, just as a uh, hint, what I mean is uh, antagonist contradiction. Uh, so we can look into the history of philosophy uh, how this. Uh, 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 these concepts were handled by previous philosophers, maybe there, I mean, as a research project, yeah. And also, uh, uh, there you can help maybe as, as philosophers to, to uh, get it clearer. On the other hand, I think uh, also... What's your question, Nihad? Yes, do you have any hints for that? Uh, what is antagonism with Kant? What is antagonism with Hegel? Or is there any uh, other clue uh, that is available? This would be interesting. Okay, yeah, thank you. No, I think clearly that's uh, important, but I think we're talking about two different levels here, right? Uh, what Marx is talking about, the antagonism between classes, here we're talking about interests. We're talking about different views, whatever, the capitalist uh, from a Marxist perspective. Of course, he wants to pay uh, the worker only uh, the value uh, which uh, he's worth for reproducing um, himself. And, and, and the worker, of course, would like uh, either to, to whatever, overcome capitalism or would at least have um, uh, pay for all the hours she or he works. So, so I think, yeah, these, these antagonisms, the world is full of these, these antagonisms, right? I think human beings, they want more and more. Um, but I think deep disagreements, I think it's not a met metaphor, as you said. I think it's just, you were talking about intellectual conflicts. I'm talking about intellectual conflicts, about exchanging arguments. You know, a deep disagreement is a disagreement that we cannot solve uh, uh, rationally. Uh, and you know, you have in Hegel's logic, you even have the dialectics, right? You have the thesis and the antithesis, which uh, constitute the antagonism, which can somehow be overcome on a higher plane as a, some form of synthesis. Uh, but you know, I think these are more, um, yeah, pr probably you can apply Hegel's dialectics, probably Erdogan uh, uh, would say, but can't be overcome 
these Maybe. disagreements on a higher level. And, 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 and yeah, so, but I think Hegel is still a consensus theoretician. So that's an interesting idea, but I don't think we have the time to, to discuss this. And I think yes, also yes. Sinem sent a question. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Sinem uh, has a question. I think you see the uh, question, please, Manuel, read the yes, I do. loudly, and then you can answer, please. Should I read it? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, given that reason is limited, given that perhaps anti-realism is true concerning objective moral truth, perhaps morality should be reconstrued in terms of understanding rather than the right thing to do. And that would perhaps dissolve deep disagreements because understanding the attempt, sorry, I lost the understanding, just a second, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. and so that under would perhaps dissolve deep disagreements because understanding the attempt to understand others requires tolerance to begin with. Okay, should we reconstrue morality in terms of understanding than the right thing to do? Yeah, I think that's pretty much, uh, that goes in the direction uh, I, I wanna go. I think it's better to not just say, oh, this is the right thing to do. You have to do this as a moral imperative, but we should rather try to understand uh, the reasoning of others, how, why others uh, have a position they're defending. And if we come to a better understanding, uh, I, I think we can also uh, uh, be more tolerant uh, towards it. So, so yeah, thank you, Sinem. I think that is a, is, is, is a good, a good proposal. Okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, Manuel, we have still two section or one section? One, just the ethics of disagreement and I can summarize this very quickly. Okay, so we can take another question, please, uh, Eylül uh, Zeynep. And uh, after Eylül Zeynep, yeah. Please Eylül Zeynep. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I was just try to uh, ask my question again. So it seems to me that saying that everybody should eat vanilla ice cream and everybody should be tolerant is two different claims that we cannot look at uh, in the same way. So I claim that even if there are no objective moral facts, the claim that everybody should be tolerant to each other uh, seems like an objective claim in, uh, in terms of its nature. So yes, maybe there are no objective moral facts that we cannot point out to, but there are uh, there is a difference between everybody should eat vanilla ice cream and everybody should be tolerant to each other. So I think the difference causes that the claim itself is objective when we form it. We form it objectively to apply to all of the all of us. Okay, got it. My quest, do you understand my question? Yes, I, was I do. To ask this, what is the difference? Okay, yeah. I think, of course, these two claims are different. One is an aesthetic uh, a claim, and the other one is a moral claim. Everyone should be tolerant. But I still don't see why it's an objective claim. I would say, if you say everyone should do this, I think it's a universalist claim, right? We want everyone uh, to do this. But so I agree that it's a universalist claim, but what does this claim make objective? You know, kind of something beyond uh, these universal judgments of human beings. So I don't see, uh, I wouldn't claim that there is this additional dimension of objectivity. I would claim, yes, it's a universalist claim and it's a moral claim. And I think we can argue like in my ethics, I'm also arguing in a consequentialist way. I think there are certain virtues uh, we have, to, we should respect uh, different views. We should be tolerant towards different views. And, and yeah, I think it would be good. Uh, we, we, the consequences would be nice if we would stop fighting uh, against each other. But I would just say that's a universalist claim, but not an objective claim. I mean, maybe you wanna explain your concept of objectivity more, or do you okay. see my point? Yeah, yeah, I see your point. I just mean objective 
like we think that it is uh, it applies to everyone uh, and um, it doesn't depend on uh, any certain conditions. But yeah, okay, I, I, I see your uh, point of view. Thank you. Okay, so we would say what you call objective, I call universalist. Okay. All right. Okay. Just a quick follow up on, on Elul's question, if it's possible. Uh, sorry, uh, Karen, uh, before you, uh, Victoria Holberg, uh, click on the recent after Victoria Holt. Over. You can also go a little bit over time. I have time if you guys want. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, please. Um, you know, as I'm listening to these theories, which is a wonderful uh, presentation, thank you so much. Uh, really clarifies a lot of things. But I'm, I find myself becoming hopeless because <laughs> I find them mechanistic. And I say to myself, well, uh, what about dishonesty, rage, vengeance? Uh, resentment, uh, refusal to think. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it seems to me that these, these systems kind of mirror the modern centralized state. It's as if, if we set everything up properly, like in a machine, then it will work, you know? Uh, so that, that's really a comment. And I, I wonder what you have to say to that. But I also, I'm really curious why you call Plato a religious thinker. And I'd like to know where that idea comes from. I mean, I mean, we know that he defined the good not as an ethical matter. I mean, to, to define the good as an ethical matter is to retro, you know, anachronistically impose upon ancient Greece uh, a division between ethics and aesthetics that uh, did not exist. I mean, he defined the good as what is desired by human beings, you know, er erotic desire, the object of erotic desire. So um, it seems to me that, uh, how, how can you call him a religious thinker? I don't understand. Okay. Uh, the, the comment, I don't think it's too mechanistic because the clashes will never be avoided, right? I think the clashes will keep, keep happening and I think we can just try to make it less severe. Uh, why Plato a religious thinker? Uh, you know, in the laws, he says God is the measure of all things. When you look at the analogy of the sun at the end of book six of the so-called Republic, he says that the good, the good in itself is in dignity and power. He uses the word dunamis beyond the being and, and such a characterization uh, and all the neoplatonics, they kind of uh, worked with, with, with this statement. Um, I, I think that is only a characterization uh, of, of the divine. And you know, there are like whatever, Edward Seller, the great historian of philosophy of the 19th century and, and Wilhelm Nestle from Mythos zum Logos, uh, they all interpret uh, the, the, the idea, the form of the good as Plato's uh, concept of, of God and, you know, also the other uh, forms. So there we have the problem now, monotheism versus uh, polytheism. So, so, so I think it's, 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 Plato is clearly a religious thinker. I hope this is, we, we can talk about this more, but I think these are some strong arguments. Well, I mean, Luc Bresson, for example, has written about this. He's a you know, very highly respected contemporary scholar of Plato. You know. Say the name again, please. Luc Brisson, French. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. He's Luc part Brisson. of the Collegium Politicum. Uh huh. I don't know what that is. Anyway, it's a yeah. scholar's work on ancient philosophy. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, but he, you know, he says that it's what it's about is the attempt to figure out how things change, how, how in this world of generation and corruption, some things don't change. And yes. Well, now we could go into Plato <laughs> interpretations. Yeah, yeah, we shouldn't. We you shouldn't. know, I think we don't have time yeah. for this, but I just gave you, I think, okay. the two strongest arguments why uh, I laws? interpret Plato with others as a okay. religious thinker. So the laws, and who were the other two people you mentioned? I mentioned the analogy of the sun, which comes before the line in yes, the cave, I, I know that. where he I says, know that. God is in dignity and in power beyond the being. And I'm mentioning him saying God is the measure 
of all things. Um, yes, and he says the forms are divine and, and, and these yes, would be my arguments. He means, he means they don't die. He doesn't mean our notion of God as a lawgiver or a creator or a judge. I mean, uh, anyway, anyway, you we'll discuss this other some thinkers. other day. Yeah, <laughs> please, uh, two other thinkers. We don't have enough time. We can, uh, thank you. Thank you, Joe. So yeah. we pass to uh, Karim. Karim Ocha, please. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I interrupted first because my question is a follow up on Elul uh, Zainab's question. And <clears throat> I, I'm not sure that the move to universalism addresses what I take to be the main, I might be mistaken, correct me Elul if I am, but the main drive behind the question, I mean, so here's how I understand it. Let's agree that there are no objective moral facts, and this is your main uh, claim. Okay, so we don't have that. It yeah. seems to follow, and this is the worry, the driving worry, I think, for, of the question is that does this mean that uh, all moral claims are on a par? Now, this doesn't mean the fact that uh, there is something about ex moral claims being a par on a par, not being on a par that is beyond the fact that it just happens that there is you know, a majority of people or universal acceptance of it or should be a universal acceptance of it. I mean, we want to claim, the intuition is that there, are, there is a difference, some kind of a hierarchy even between different moral claims, even if we accept that there are no actual moral facts out there. And we don't want to reduce morality to what we happen to accept what we happen to accept, be it on a local level or on a subjective level or on a even global level, universal level. So I don't think the move to universality, I think, addresses the, that worry. And I wonder if on your position, if, if you think that all more, given your rejection of moral facts, do you think that all moral claims are on a par? They're just whether it's torturing babies for fun or uh, breaking a promise or, you know, just speaking on behind someone's back or something like this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. No, I don't think that all moral claims are, are on a par. I mean, torturing babies is clearly much worse than breaking the promise to come to a birthday party. Uh, so I think there is a huge, a huge difference, right? A, a huge difference in weight, um, but you know, and then you will ask me. So, so how if you say there is no there are no more effects? So, so how do you do you explain uh, uh, this difference? And and I will tell you that's my moral intuition. Uh, that's I think about it. All right, I, I analyze it, I compare it. Uh, but I think we have never more than my judgment, my thinking, my feeling, my comparing the the different moral claims. And saying, yeah, kind of uh, not coming to the birthday party is, yeah, you should have come because you know it's good to keep your promise. But I would still say that's a minor in thing, right? Uh, incident. But but of course, uh, torturing a baby or, or killing an innocent person uh, uh, that, that without good reason, um, you know, that, that that is horrible. And of course, and then we can discuss the death penalty, can you uh, uh, kill someone who, who, who brutally murdered others? Um, and then it gets more difficult, but no, they're not all on the same, on the, on the par, but I think that is not, I'm not claim. I think I have reasons for this judgment. It's my intuition, I have, can give you arguments and, and compare these two, two cases, but I don't think there is more than my moral intuition and my moral cognition. Uh, okay, thank you, Manuel. Uh, yeah, I have some question, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time. If you want, uh, we can pass to uh, last section. Sure, and I will make this very, very brief. Hold on, I'm closing here the shutter because it's really the sun is getting into my office. Okay, um, here the need for an ethics of disagreement, last section of the talk. Um, so I think the central question, a bit of an upshot of what we talked so far, is what are the attitudes, behaviors, 
and actions we should take towards the people we disagree with and have to live together. Um, in order to come to terms with deep disagreements on values, justice, and moral issues, uh, that's my central claim, we should develop an ethics of disagreement. An argument for the need of such an ethics is that theoretical disagreements often turn into practical conflicts. So basically, if we say it in the modern language, how can we manage these uh, disagreements? How can we cope with these deep disagreements? How we, can we make them less violent, less dangerous? How can we avoid that people um, hate each other just because they disagree on religion? Uh, let's say, well, how, how can we uh, achieve it that, that, that people say, okay, you, you believe in, in, in this God and I don't believe in any God or I'm not sure whether to believe, how, how can we still uh, be friendly uh, with each other? And, and so I think that's another kind of dimension which we should really devote a lot of attention uh, to, to, to think about this. And, you know, I'm having some preliminary um, answers, you know, I already gave the example, I'm not reading this, uh, the case of abortion, right? Some people say the abortion performing doctor is a murderer, and, and then they feel justified to, to kill this person. I think that's just like one, um, one example how a deep disagreement on a moral issue like abortion uh, can turn to practical uh, violence. And, and, and that is exactly, I think, why we need such a and ethics of disagreement, and I'm making some 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 very brief proposals here. Um, there is also a text if you're interested in this. Um, so I think uh, the central claim is um, an ethics of disagreement should be primarily conceived of as a form of virtue ethics. So we need certain virtues, and to give you an example, uh, the first one is to acknowledge deep disagreements. I think that's uh, an intellectual virtue to acknowledge deep disagreements. And in order to do this, we conflicting parties should not oversimplify the matter by degrading the opponent as ignorant, irrational, unintelligent, insincere, evil, without evidence or good reasons. Yeah, there are probably evil people, but often we just degrade others far too easily. Uh, often those, I keep reading here on the slide, often those with whom we disagree are as informed, competent, intelligent, and good-willed as we are. Both as individuals and as members of the human species, we should avoid epistemic arrogance and adopt epistemic modesty, or if you prefer, epistemic humility. These are some suggestions um, moving towards how such an ethics of disagreement could look like. Next, uh, virtue, the virtue of seeking dialogue and mutual understanding. Uh, we should overcome the unrealistic ideal and goal of consensus or agreement. However, moral discussions and argument are not futile. Therefore, we should seek dialogue and mutual understanding. And I think we should especially stop reading our only our blog and live in our bubble and discuss with our friends. We should discuss with the people uh, with who we disagree because I think that can open our mind and that can uh, make, us, make us advance. Um, so I think we also need an ethics of conversation and listening. We, you know, our workshop will be exactly uh, on this June 18 and 19. Um, in order to promote dialogue and conversations an ethics of disagreement should support freedom of the press, free speech, public debates, and public reason. That, I think, is, can be derived from, if we want to have more dialogue and better mutual understanding, uh, we need these values. Um, an ethics of disagreement, I think, should also support deliberative democracy. That's a concept, you know, you, people debate, uh, and uh, there's public reason etc cetera, etc cetera. or you know we have to adopt uh, we will never overcome all disagreements by by debating uh, we could probably make them less violent and less dangerous and and of course we also always resolving 
disagreements peacefully. Uh, we also need some procedures like majority rule. We all acknowledge uh, this procedure. We say, okay, we disagree, but we want fair play at least. Um, and then of course we have to say a majority rule, is like is it now, should everyone have one vote or should probably some people have a little more. So, and of course we will disagree about this. Um, yeah, toleration, I already said this. Um, a toleration generally starts off with the judgment that some behaviors, beliefs or values are objectionable for some reasons. Without such a negative moral epistemic or aesthetic judgment, uh, there would be no need for tolerance. So if we agree with something, we don't need to be tolerant. In order to be tolerant, first we have to somehow reject it out of some reason. Toleration also presupposes that the objection to a behavior, belief, or value is not so radical that it cannot be overridden or trumped by reasons for accepting it anyway. Um, this combination of disapproval and acceptance is usually called the paradox of toleration. There is lots of literature on this. Um, and here comes, I'm coming to the end, uh, almost, we're almost done. Um, so I think we can, we can defend an argument for toleration from deep disagreements. Um, and that could be an epistemological justification of uh, toleration. And how does this argument go? If we have good reasons to acknowledge deep disagreements and to respect opposing positions, we also have good reasons to tolerate the values and moral views we disagree with. If we accept that consensus or agreement is an ideal hardly to be realized, we should be more inclined to tolerate values and moral views we disapprove of. That would be the argument and the conclusion. That's the last slide. Um, a virtue ethics, uh, you know, I'm proposing uh, the mentioned virtues um, as a start uh, toward developing an ethics of disagreement. And I think uh, such a virtue ethic should be amended by elements of a consequentialist ethics. An ethics of disagreement is best conceived of as a form of virtue ethics. Nevertheless, this approach is open to amendment by element from a consequentialist ethics. All the virtues proposed for an ethics of disagreement can also be justified by their good or desirable consequences. That would be my claim. Deep disagreements recognize opposing positions as worthy of respect, seek dialogue and mutual understanding, tolerate opposing behaviors, values, or value, sorry, opposing behaviors, beliefs, or values. Then we will, in most cases, also reduce practical conflicts and promote a peaceful coexistence among those who disagree but have to live together. In doing so, we also promote an increase in pleasure and a reduction in pain and suffering, or promote happiness or human welfare or the satisfaction of informed preferences. However, we want a consequentialist approach. Um, so we will increase pleasure and reduce pain among people, citizens, and cultures. In a world of deep disagreements on values, justice, and moral issues, thank you so much for your attention and patience. Uh, thank you, Manuel, for this uh, <clears throat> section as well. So uh, I think there are some questions. I have some questions, of course, but first uh, I can give uh, the floor to the audience. Yeah, yeah, Karen, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is great. I mean, this is the, I think the juice of the, <laughs> the main, uh, okay, I, I have a, a question. It's a sort of a composed question and it's, a, it's not a critique. It's more of a, a way of being constructive to the um, direction you are trying to push. Yeah, help me to move towards. In direction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it, 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 I, I did some work on this. So I, I, mean, I just have a few, few uh, things to say. 
just first, just a quick note. It's just very interesting that you mentioned the deliberative democracy part, especially if you contrast to the idea of the beginning of the talk where you rejected Rawls and Habermas. So, I mean, but that's, but let's put this aside. Just, um, but I think something needs to be said there just to the extent to do for the uh, reader or the hearer, right? Because typically Rawls and Habermas are the main defenders, so to speak, and of the liberative democracy and deliberation has, you know, this notion of consensus. If it is not actual, it has to be some sort of a normative idea, a regulative idea. Anyways, so just that aside, so I, I want to say, consider we have, like you said, like well-intended opponents, cooperative, democratically civil opponents who's willing to work through the disagreement. I mean, they are fully committed to the conversation, let's say. But they, we radically disagree and maybe fundamentally or deeply. And just to give a simple example, we might completely both be committed to freedom of speech, but I think that freedom of speech excludes allowing pro-Nazis to you know, uh, 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 demonstrate publicly while the other thing, no, they have to be. Say a typical example would be what, you know, a, 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 let's say a German understanding of freedom of speech versus an American understanding of freedom of speech. Uh, what I want to say is that the virtual ethics approach might not be sufficient to, 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 to push us through because although it has, I think, all the, what you might call the external aspects like the behavioral or the, uh, having the correct intention towards it, doing it for the right reasons, you know, at the right time, having the phronesis even for it, etc. I don't think it will go far enough, especially for uh, if you consider the the kind of challenge the, on the level of practice that these disagreements raise. So I, I will I will very briefly elaborate. I might be someone that I have a genuine commitment to being tolerant. Uh, I, I, I am really trying to be inclusive and I'm happy to reconsider my view. However, when I'm faced with the, let's say the anti-abortionist or the pro-Nazi, whatever, there is something, um, their position challenges kind of my sense of self and what I take to be my identity, so to speak. And that threat on the level of the existential level is not something that my commitment to tolerance will deal with. I mean, um, I might still, as a matter of fact, in practice, close, on, close myself off, become dismissive. So I might have all these nice, intent, well-intended maybe commitments to be inclusive and tolerant, but I might simply be incapable. I mean, my responsibility might just break down in practice. And I think we are seeing this a lot, especially with, uh, say, if you think of the right populists and the way, you know, they call them the chauvinist opponent. They're not even ready to listen to you. And no matter how inclusive you want to try to be and respect them as persons or having autonomy, there is an existential threat that in, in an actual disagreement that you will feel, and that threat might undermine our ability to even be, you know, uh, proper agents. And we might just fall into dogmatism, becoming ourselves defensive and just wanting. So the, all I'm saying this is that the, the virtue, my suggestion would be, and this is in some sense what I try to argue for in some context, other similar context, is that we might need what we might call a meta virtue, something that, has to do with the self-relation, my relationship to my own self, my relationship to my own identity. And this requires self-work um, or self-fashioning. Foucault might be helpful here. Um, but I mean, there is this idea that I have to develop the ability to absorb the insults, maybe just a perceived one in such a way that would allow me to exercise the tolerance that you are calling for. So the virtual ethics on its own, it seems to me it's insufficient. It has to be complemented with something that takes into account 
the self-relationality and not only the other relationality. Sorry, I, I, I went on for too long. Apologies. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Uh, thank you for this. Yeah, that's very interesting. And, 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 and certainly there are, when our identity is threatened by an opposing view, is put into question, uh, you know, psychologically speaking, how can we uh, cope with this, our self-love, our, our narcissism? And, and, and of course, I think there are clearly, let's say, psychic dispositions, uh, which make it easier to, to deal with, 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 with opposing views, especially with views that, that fundamentally uh, uh, question me. Um, so, so yeah, I guess we all have to, to strive towards being kind of more self-confident um, I think that's very, I think self-confidence is a key uh, a characteristics. If we, if we achieve this, this self-confidence, I think we can also uh, easier deal with people who, who put our views and our values and our, our shared beliefs, uh, our most important beliefs in, into question. Yeah, I think that's an interesting supplement, an interesting complement, uh, which, which one can think about and, and, you know, how should we, which psychological or psychic dispositions uh, uh, do we need to, to be more tolerant and to be, uh, to, to, to deal with, with others uh, criticizing us. You know, it comes down a lot also to criticism. We all don't like uh, criticism and, 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 and how can we still smile while others criticize it? Yeah, so I think, thank you. That's a very uh, important point. Uh, your first remark, um, sure. I'm on the one hand, is it a contradiction? On the one hand, I'm, uh, I'm saying we, we need deliberative democracy. On the other hand, um, I, I, I criticize Habermas and Rawls. I'm not so sure whether it's really uh, such such a, a contradiction. You know, there is this book by Thompson and Amy Goodman about moral disagreements, and they're also arguing for 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 a deliberative democracy. I think you know, also deliberative democracy uh, doesn't need to be focusing on consensus. I think we can have a deliberative democracy, and we can still uh, try to un understand our disagreements better. We can still um, find compromises based on the discussions uh, in, 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 in our discussions. So I, I think to, uh, to make it short, I think deliberative democracy isn't necessarily or essentially tied to consensus. So, so I'm not so sure whether uh, this doesn't really go. <laughs> go. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question? Uh, I think there, are, there is no further question. Let me ask uh, some question, uh, Manuel. Sure. I think uh, when you uh, say deep disagreement, uh, you don't refer to metaphysical uh, disagreement. You know, generally, uh, when you uh, explain these uh, uh, expression you refers to reality, uh, but so when uh, you know uh, if there is a poss metaphysical possibility on uh, agreement, I can we uh, we can uh, realize this uh, agreement in reality. Uh, you know, for instance, um, uh, Hans Gadamer, you know he. Uh, he refers to fusion of horizon, you know, uh, with different perspective, he can together to discuss the, the same issues in, uh, you know, from different perspective, but at the end of this the discussion, you know, we see a fusion of horizon. I think uh, when you say, uh, you know, we need a, a virtue ethics, uh, uh, especially, uh, uh, seeking dialogue and mutual understanding. Uh, it reminds me uh, this concept, I mean, uh, the fusion of horizon. Uh, so do you agree with uh, Hans Grademer's uh, explanation? I mean, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, we can open your uh, your uh, self to another in mutual uh, discussion and then we can find a consensus about anything about political or uh, ethical issues okay um i think you have to to remind me a little bit of Gardamer's idea of the fusional horizon to give you a really good answer to your question. I just uh, give me, let me allow me to give a preliminary answer. You know, I think if we look for if we look for discussions, I'm thinking also a lot about Socrates, right? Mm -hmm. um, discussing with these brothers like the dialectics as as like we see it in Plato's dialogues. And you know, we can also mutually question what we hold to be our knowledge, what we hold our to be our our convictions and, and epistemic uh, beliefs. Uh, so, so I was more thinking along uh, these lines. So, but but I mean, if you would connect this uh, with with Gadama, I, I might be able to say okay. a bit more. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Another question, you know, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, I agree with, you see, I agree with, <laughs> with, uh, with your position about the ontological uh, ethics, yeah, uh, maybe uh, uh, we cannot find universal principle that uh, can be applied to everyone, but I think uh, moral uh, realism uh, can be defended against uh, ethical realism. You know, uh, ethical realism generally refers to different cultures, but uh, especially uh, you know, current uh, uh, the current uh, globalization more and more drives us to uh, you know universal globe. You know, uh, just let's say one universal culture, uh, but uh, I think uh, we can find uh, some, uh, uh, we can defend the position of ethical realism, especially, you know, uh, in the previous section, uh, like uh, Karen said, we find some uh, general principle that, uh, uh, are accepted by many culture, many society. For instance, killing in innocent people is forbidden. You know, robbery is forbidden. You know, uh, other uh, kind of things like this are forbidden. So I think by referring this kind of, uh, you know, common point, uh, we can defend the position of ethical realism uh, against the uh, ethical uh, relativism, especially uh, in this uh, current uh, global uh, process. What do you think? I'm wondering. Uh, I think I see your argument. You're saying kind of the world is becoming more global. The cultures are kind of getting more and more similar to we towards each other. So we're overcoming provincialism and tribalism, but I would still say uh, that is a move towards a more universal moral views, let's say. But you know, the, the ethical realists say beyond these uh, moral views, there are these moral facts, like there are astronomical uh, facts. Um, and, and I think the globalization, um, where should these facts come from? Uh, and, 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 you know, like Plato's, Plato's form uh, uh, of the good. I just don't think it, it, it exists. So I think, yeah, probably our, our moralities, our views are, are getting more and more similar in, in, in the modern world. You know, like we can all watch the internet and we, we, we can easily hear the same philosophers uh, talk on YouTube um, or, 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 or something. And we watch all the same movies from, uh, and so of course the so-called cultural imperialism. So probably the Western cultural moral values are, are are promoted. But I think yeah, that leads to more universal moral views. But I, I still think that still doesn't create the moral facts or the objective moral reality, which exist in mind independent ways, right? So kind of probably in our minds, we have more similar views, but I don't see these facts. I don't think how this movement you're describing can lead, can, can somehow magically 
uh, how, how these facts suddenly pop up. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Sinemoja has a uh, question. Uh, uh, please read the uh, chat. Uh, yeah, she says, Manuel. perhaps ethics of disagreement should be complemented by ethics of agreement as well. Agreeing with others for the right reason. Yeah, I think, you know, at least that's my view, my momentary view, which is progressing. Um, yeah, I think we, we, we should, of course, keep looking for, for agreement, right? We can ask, how can we uh, achieve uh, agreement? And of course, if we all, let's say, if we all respect each other, if we are willing to listen to each other, if we try to get rid of our, rid of our prejudices, Uh, towards others because of uh, whatever the reasons uh, uh, there are. Yes, I think, sure, I think that could be one section of an ethics of, of, of disagreement. Thank you, Sinem, that's a good, good idea. We should also focus more on how can we have more agreements? How can we uh, multiply the number of real agreements? Uh, that is not agreeing just for the sake of one's own advantage yeah and i think that's also what philosophy uh, is partly for right kind of we 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 want to improve i mean it's kind of i, I remember uh, once or twice i had uh, uh, i was writing a thesis and in the middle of the thesis i s said wow i'm i'm on the wrong track right so i changed my mind i thought my initial thesis was was wrong and uh, that was a very good Good feeling, right? And kind of, you know, people discussing with each other, and in the end, uh, they say, "Okay, you kind of convinced me of of, of your position." Uh, that's certainly one way to deal with disagreements. But you know, my point is just I'm saying, yes, we can, we should look for more uh, agreement. But still, um, it's it's so hard. There will be still. I don't really see. Um, how, how, let's say, uh, an agnostic uh, can, can convince uh, a, a Catholic and, and how an atheist can convince uh, a Muslim or a Muslim can convince an agnostic. These things happen, right? People lose their religion, people suddenly become religious, but I think these are rather rare cases and not uh, the majority of cases. Uh, thank you, Sinamocha. Uh, Manuel, uh, in previous section, you said we have uh, moral intuition. Uh, I have a question about this, uh, this uh, expression. Uh, so the, where does uh, the uh, moral intuition uh, come from? Uh, does it belong to the nature of human being or depends on culture? So if it, the, it's belongs to the nature of human beings. So by referring to uh, this uh, structure, uh, you know, maybe uh, in mutual discussion, we can find even some universal moral principle. So what do you mean by uh, this expression, with, uh, you know, uh, moral intuition? Yeah, well, I think we, let's go back to when we were little children let's say we were five or six, and I think we all felt un treated unjustly by our parents. Sometimes we were did a little thing and we were punished very hard the other time. So I think we all have some, let's say, yeah, some moral sense. You know, Aristotle talks about uh, the sense of justice. We have justice, we have perception of things like justice, or, or, or injustice, and you know, intuition comes from intuere, like to see uh, uh, something. So, 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 so I think um, clearly somehow in our nature as, as human beings, we have such um, a moral sense. And of course, we again now could get into nature versus nurture. Of course, that is culturally uh, directed 
in, in, in certain ways, but you know, children, moral development, you know, Aristotle says, okay, if um, our parents, our educators, the laws of the political communities we live in direct us in a certain way, direct us towards just actions, we will develop a just character. So of course, um, and if I, if I grow up in this culture or I grow up in that society, that, that, that will make a difference. But still, there are also individual differences, right? Uh, some people grow up, let's be concrete, uh, with the Ten Commandments and, and say, okay, um, do not lie, do not kill. But then at some point, you move on and you say, well, but our actions have consequences, right? Uh, it's not just the actions. So probably uh, this insight that actions have consequences and that these consequences, let's say, yeah, the example, Robin Hood steals in order to save uh, people's lives. So, so probably that also changes uh, our, our view. So I think, but it's still, we still have the same moral sense. We want to somehow uh, be good people. We want to do the right thing. Um, but we probably change our views uh, growing up, thinking about it, um, whatever, studying philosophy, studying ethics, uh, we can probably come around from being a deontologist to being a consequentialist. Okay, thank you, Manuel. But uh, by the way, uh, we should uh, end the meeting in 10 minutes. We can take uh, a short question. Uh, uh, yeah, Karen, please. Yes, my hand has been. Okay, so this is a, a general question about the overall talk, right? Right. Uh, it just um, it's making me wonder about your position regarding what uh, your use of the notion of reason, um, and it, it's just very straightforward. I mean, we started off by uh, deep disagreement as basically this is the disagreement where ra reason fails, right? So, so we have a failure of reason, we have a disagreement, and then we end up with. Uh, th uh, that, okay, we have to shift our attention towards the ethics of this agreement, right? And this is the management of the disagreement, the how, the how should it, it's no more about, uh, you know, it's just how we go about the management. As sometimes sorry to you interrupt, have I also think we have to question why does reason fail, right? I think that's also so important to understand the phenomenon, why do we disagree? What are the sources? What are the reasons? Sorry for interrupting. No, no, I mean, but, uh, and you know, you had the three, I, I, I noted down three ones. They can be irreconcilable belief systems. They can be different interests. There can be cognitive approach, right? The burdens of judgment. And of course, they're not mutually exclusive. There, there can be all kinds of uh, this and other. Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, the attention or the uh, main contribution, and, and this is where I think I most agree with you, is that, okay, we need to figure out how to manage the disagreement. However, in the way you articulated the management of the disagreement, there seems to be a fairly strong reliance on reason. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so, I, so that's that's where, I mean, I'll, I'll, the intuitively, just to clarify maybe where I'm coming from, intuitively, I thought you might refer to maybe um, rhetorics, a different strategy and talking about persuasion instead of convincing. And just to give an example from uh, Maeve Cook, who, who is a Habermasian, but she criticizes things that you take issue with, with Habermas. Anyway, but so one example would be, if I want to convince you to become a vegetarian, yeah, I mean, maybe reason will completely fail, but one way to do so is maybe to just take you to a slaughterhouse, right? I mean, is this an argument? Am I, so this is, I'm not really using a reason, but I am making an argument of some sorts by taking you to the, to the slaughterhouse. And I thought that the ethics of this agreement might maybe, develop these kinds of possibilities, but the reliance, what I took to be uh, a bit surprised by it, the reliance on reason and in the articulation of the ethics of this agreement seems to kind of is intention with the uh, failure of reason from, you know, in the case we are interested in the this deep disagreement. Yeah, thank you for this. Yeah, I think uh, an experience 
the experience of seeing these animals slaughtered and seeing how they're slaughtered one after uh, the next that can probably change you and kind of make me come around to your vegetarian position more than all the arguments uh, uh, you read um, and, and we exchange. No, I, I totally uh, agree with this. I think experiences, more experiences, experiences change us. Experiences can often be better uh, uh, than arguments. Um, but I still uh, think, uh, yeah, that our, our reason is kind of if we have to ask ourselves, what should I do in life? In which direction should I go? How should I use uh, these decades I have here on, on, on this planet? I'm, I'm, I, I still, I'm not ready to, to jump into irrationalism or something. I think still our reason is still a very good source of, of orientation. It's still a very good, uh, guidance uh, which we have but I just uh, my, my point is just I think um, that uh, we should not be overconfident about uh, the powers of reason I think we need a more uh, contemporary uh, view of, of our our reason and you know as I said I don't think that reason is like a divine element and but of course here we come again in different belief uh, systems if, if you believe that God created man and we are a similitude um, of God then of course we will say yeah we're not similar to God because we have two hands or two feet we're similar to God because uh, we have the divine spark uh, uh, within us and, and and of course here we're entering again the the the, the the, the agreement between, let's say, a religious person and 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 a non-religious person, and but yeah, I think experiences are important. That's you know we Erdal and I and Sinem and I we all know us from from Istanbul Shahir University, and we had a very good experience there. And there were people, uh, believers, non-believers, agnostics, um, all working together and 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 trying to to have a good time and like each other, even if they had different. You. So I think such an experience, um, we never mentioned this today, but it was a very good experience. And I think more people should, should have similar experiences. Yeah, sorry, uh, Manuel, unfortunately, it is going to shut down automatically in five minutes. Uh, uh, I think, you, you know, for, sorry, uh, Sinem Moja. Uh, I can quickly read Sinem's yeah, thing. Please, please, yeah. In relation to Karam's question, if I understand correctly, reason fails to determine what the right thing is, but reason may succeed in trying to understand another view. I think reason has this capability, and I think that's already a, a good progress. Yeah, yeah, I think she's trying to elucidate uh, your view. Defend yeah. reason. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyways, thank you, Sinem. Hoja, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Manuel. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, unfortunately, we don't uh, have enough time to discuss uh, and take other question and remark. Uh, thank you, uh, dear Manuel, for this uh, lovely discussion and for this uh, enlightening speech. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, and uh, before ending the meeting, let me say a few words uh, about uh, our next philosophy talk series. As we mentioned in the first talk, uh, we uh, decided to organize uh, four philosophy talks for this semester, for this term. This talk uh, was the third and the last one of this semester, this term. We are hopefully going to organize the philosophy talk series next semesters. We hope to see you over there, uh, including Manuel. <laughs> so the uh, announcement will be made on social media, on the Twitter account and web, web page of our uh, philosophy department. Once again, thank you, dear Manuel, for this lovely uh, talk and thank members of our audience for joining us. Thank you. Have a, have a nice day. Have a nice weekend. Yakshamlar, görüşürüz. Thank you again. Thank you, Manuel.
Thank you for staying so long. We've been together almost three hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Benji, please.